How is everyone? <laughs> Good. Well, I'm very excited for all that we have going on today. Uh, a couple of announcements for you. There's a lot of stuff that our missions department is doing right now that I thought that I would just clue you into. And then when you get your emails this week that your leaders will forward to you. Um, there'll be some links and stuff in there so you can get some more information. But on a monthly basis, our missions department is planning some outreach activities. And one of them, well, they're all going to be on the third Saturday of the month. So this month, that's February 20th. And we're going to be building some planter boxes to give to the uh, Habitat for Humanity Restore. Uh, that they can then sell and, you know, build up some money and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in helping with that, I'll send that link out so you can sign up. I know there's a lot of spots still available. I checked this morning. Um, but then if you're also just interested in what things might be coming up in the future, be sure to keep an eye on that because, as I said, every month there's going to be some kind of way to reach out and help other people. Um, and then the second thing is... Actually, I didn't get a chance to talk to Michelle, but Michelle in our room here, she's leading, helping Jackie Olsgaard lead a Bible study that starts uh, Tuesday the 23rd. It's going to be a really interesting Bible study about Abraham and about God's plans for serving and reaching people and just God's love for the world. Um, if you're interested in that, they're going to meet Tuesdays at 12 o'clock uh, virtually through Zoom. So it'll be from 12 to 1. And I'll send a link or some email addresses so you can get signed up for that if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, lots going on. Lots of ways that we can love our community and learn to love them better. So if you're interested, join that. Uh, right now, though, let's just turn our focus to God and give him our time today. All right, good morning. I invite you to stand with me and worship today. From the darkness, I called your name. And into darkness, your mercy came. Called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love! You bore my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. And you called me out, lifted me
for your amazing love, Jesus. Thank you for your great love for us. We're so thankful for it, God. We just we worship you, Lord, and we, we build our lives upon your love, Jesus. We're so thankful for who you are, God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Patrick. You guys may be seated. Oh, really good stuff. Good to be with you. Um, let's dive right into what we believe about Jesus. We believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. Having been conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, he lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father and voluntarily atoned for the sins of all humanity by dying on the cross as their substitute, thus satisfying divine justice and accomplishing salvation for all who trust in him alone. He rose bodily from the grave, was seen by many, and ascended into heaven where he intercedes for his people and rules as Lord of creation. Jesus will come again to earth personally and visibly to fulfill history and the eternal plan of God. In our last discussion, we said that Jesus is key to understanding God. We shared Hebrews 1.3, saying Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He, Jesus, has made him known. Jesus, as the word of God, the message, and the connection to all of humanity, reveals the vastness, the otherness that we were talking about last week of God to us. Like we said in our last discussion, whenever we want to know what God is like, how the God of the Bible is different than any other belief system, and how it is even possible for us to have a relationship with that God, we can look to Jesus. So that's what we're going to do. What do we believe about Jesus? And I don't want to presume knowledge right here. I want to make sure that we all have an opportunity to see whether for the first time or in a renewed, confirming way that the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who we call the Christ, the Messiah, God incarnate, God made man, was a historically verifiable person. So for a moment, I want to pretend that we don't have any of the New Testament or even non-biblical but still Christian writings about Jesus. Let's pretend that we don't have those things. Even without all of those, we're still going to have to deal with the documents of that time period that talk about Jesus of Nazareth. From outside sources, historical accounts from the Talmud, from Josephus, from Tacitus, and Pliny the Younger, to name a few, and what they have to say about Jesus. It's helpful, it's helpful for us to see what these sources that are not Christian sources. They're actually, many of them are hostile against the claims of Christianity. They still account for the person in the life of Jesus. So writing about 50 years after Jesus's death, 
Josephus accounts for the life of the crucifixion of Jesus. Here's where it's just common sense. If a historian that's not a Christian accounts for the life of somebody, if, if that person were fictional or didn't exist, that historian loses all credibility, right? If I talk about the history of Aslan the lion, and I talk about it in a way of history books, I'm going to not be a verifiable historian, right? So Josephus, who's not a Christian, has no reason to account for the life of Jesus other than if it actually existed. And within 50 years of his lifetime, there are still people alive that could say either, yeah, he did exist, or he didn't. So there's some strictly logic right there. Josephus states that the followers of Jesus, that Josephus called Christians, followers that remained and prominent to Josephus' present time, claim to see him raised from the dead. All this from a non-Christian man, simply accounting for history. And then about 20 or 30 years later, in a totally different part of the world, a Roman senator, Tacitus, also accounted for the life, death, and the following of Jesus in a historical account for Rome. He describes the extreme penalty of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate and how the followers of Jesus spread what he called a most mischievous superstition throughout all of Judea and even into Rome in his lifetime. So with just non-biblical sources like that, you're really going to have to do away with mountains of evidence for the life and teachings of Jesus to get to the point where the existence of Jesus is even in question. If we were to tell someone that they needed to prove their existence to us, but then we said you can't use any writings, because of course all writings can be forged, and you can't use any people that knew us, because of course people can lie. If we tried to make someone prove existence, but said all documents and all testimony is not proof, we'd be in about the same position of the people that deny the life of Jesus. It's simply absolutely untenable to deny the life of Jesus. So much more to say on that, but we, we got to move on here. So once we reconcile that Jesus clearly existed, we have to look at what he said, what he did, and how he influenced people. Remember, thus far, we're still not even diving into our biblical account, biblical evidence. We're dealing with non-biblical evidence and, and just simply logic. All of the historians I mentioned before, they account for Jesus of Nazareth in a way that is completely consistent with what the Bible does tell us. He was a Jewish teacher that traveled throughout villages and communities teaching not only the foundations of the Jewish faith, but moreover applications and implications that were distinct from the teachings of rabbis. This is what we hear from historians about Jesus again. These extra-biblical accounts, which can still be researched today, tell us a great multitude of people was impacted by Jesus and his teachings and the signs and the wonders that those that followed him performed. Ultimately, the historians tell us that the Jewish leaders deemed Jesus' message and his representation to be blasphemy, and they played a role in bringing him under religious and political condemnation and death by means of crucifixion. All of that, we can know historically, without even engaging yet in the word of God. We've taken time to demonstrate the verifiability of the life of Jesus of Nazareth and how it's viewed from the outside. But now we're going to transition a bit to returning to our statement of faith and the biblical basis for our belief. C.S. Lewis, he poses this uh, very famous rationale for the person, and maybe even it's you, that is okay with the existence of Jesus can't deny the history of Jesus, says he's a good man that walked the earth and was a good moral teacher, but he's not God. Here's what C.S. Lewis had to say about that. This is the strange, significant thing. Even his enemies, when they read the Gospels, do not usually get the impression of silliness and conceit. Still less do unprejudiced readers. Jesus says that he is humble and meek, and we believe him. Not noticing that if he were really just a man, humility and meekness are the very last characteristics we could attribute to some of his sayings. 
I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a good moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not let that open to us. He did not intend to. So, so good there. So returning to some of the key pieces of our understanding and belief about Jesus, there's a couple of central pieces of theology that we got to get. First is that Jesus is fully God, fully divine, fully eternal and perfect. He did not give up any of his godness, his divinity, becoming fully man as we celebrate at Christmas time. He's worthy to be worshipped and is powerful and authoritative as only God is. No angel, no saint, no one else is God to be worshipped like God and prayed to. Only God. Colossians 1.9 tells us, In Jesus, all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. And then later in 2.9, In Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is fully God, and at his birth, full divinity broke into the temporal, finite nature to become man. This is vital because only someone that is fully God would be capable of paying the penalty for all of humanity. A man couldn't do that. The life of just a man could not pay the penalty for all of humanity. Also, only one who is fully God could be a mediator between mankind and God and reveal God to us. As man was dead in our sins, we needed God to break into our limitations, break into our hopelessness, and save us. God needed to do that. Jesus was also fully man. Fully God, fully man. He had a physical body, mind, and emotions like any other human. He was born, he matured, he fatigued, he was vulnerable, and he died like any other human being. In fact, he was so human that those that were closest to him, including at times his family and those in his own hometown, they didn't believe he was anything other than man. That's how human he was. He was born of a virgin mother, Mary. He was conceived miraculously in the womb of his mother, completely like any other person in all of history. This is how it's possible for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. And I get that this is kind of hard to fathom, and unique, special, once-in-history events like this definitely are. But Jesus being both fully God and fully man is vital because only he could fulfill God's perfect will applied to us. Only someone who is fully man can be mankind's true representative. Jesus succeeded where Adam and the rest of us failed. Only someone who is fully man could be a fitting substitute as a sacrifice. If he was not fully man, he could not really have died in our place. Only someone who is fully man could fulfill God's original purpose for mankind to rule over all creation and could be our relevant example and sympathetic high priest. He truly experienced what we experience. He wasn't just pretending to be man. He was, fully. If God were to merely just do away with his will for creation and specifically mankind, to just do away with the law that he gave us, how we are to perfectly live righteously as God intended, and how we can live in relationship with him. If God were just to do away with all that he said, then God would all of a sudden cease to be perfectly righteous and perfectly holy and even perfectly wrathful against sin. Now, wrath, that's definitely something we struggle with. 
but it's a clear necessary part of the holiness of God to be wrathful against sin. So rather than doing away with the law, just shoving it under the rug or glossing over it, God fulfilled the law perfectly in the life of Jesus and made that accountable or accounted to his followers. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, Jesus talks about this, how I did not come away to, or come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Uh, verse 17 in Matthew chapter 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus makes it possible for us to live perfectly righteously before God. Not because we do that, but because his life is accounted for our sake. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's an exchange there. Your imperfection, my imperfection was credited towards him. His righteousness given to us. It's amazing for any and all who will accept it. This was the fulfillment of God's plan. All the way back to Adam and Eve's original sin and all of the Old Testament was paving the way for this to be possible. So that's why Jesus did not come and the Old Testament no longer matters. Jesus fulfilled it. It's what led up to that, that any and all who accept it might be declared righteous. Jesus died in his voluntary death on Good Friday, knowing it was coming and willingly taken on, he atoned for or paid for all the sins of humanity. He chose to be our substitute and take upon himself the penalty that we deserve. In the temptation, Satan tried to convince him to take a shortcut. You can just prove yourself to them and not go the way of the cross. And Jesus rebuked him. In his death, Jesus satisfied God's righteous wrath against sin and his perfect justice so that every sin, every single sin is accounted for, is paid for. Nothing's glossed over. God is perfectly holy and righteous. We are able to be in his presence. It happens in the death of Jesus. This offer of salvation in Jesus, when we talk about how you can only be saved by Jesus, People that don't accept that take that as a statement of condemnation. It's not condemnation. The offer of salvation, John 3, 17, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but because we are all standing without Jesus in condemnation already, John 3, 18, Jesus' death is the only comprehensive, perfect sacrifice for all our behalf. All that want to receive the promise of salvation in Jesus, do so. John 3, 16. Maybe you've heard that verse before. Jesus is risen. Here is a point of massive significance. Jesus rose bodily from death on Easter Sunday. If that is true, if that actually happened, then that's the ultimate game changer that demands a response to everything that Jesus said and did and invites us into. Jesus' resurrection, conquering death, it was witnessed by hundreds of people in different situations over the course of many days. And while we earlier covered the verifiability of Jesus' life and death, now we're just briefly touching on the verifiability of Jesus' resurrection. And I want to turn to uh, one avenue of this, there's so much we could go into about the verifiability of his resurrection, but I want to look at the disciples. These are people who saw firsthand the teachings, the miracles, and the death of Jesus. Now, if they saw and heard all of that firsthand, and ultimately they all too were willing to die for their belief about Jesus, what does that tell us? Well, 
initially, maybe not too much because people of all kinds of religions are willing to die for their beliefs, right? True. But a major difference with these disciples is that they were willing to die for something that they either personally firsthand saw or didn't see. Either they saw it and it was real or they didn't see it and they were making it up. The fact that these disciples would all continue without any differences in their accounts, all of them had the same accounts, and still would continue to teach about that, testify to that, without any alternative accounts, and without any reward for gain, and with a lot to lose. And they would still all teach these beliefs in perfect unity, even under torture and death. That shows us that it wasn't just beliefs hopes that they followed. Because people die for beliefs that they believe are true. I'll grant you that. But it's untenable to think that people like these disciples would all, in complete unity and agreement, be willing to die for something that they knew not to be true. In other words, for the people that followed Jesus, they saw his death and they accounted for his resurrection and all testified to the truth of that to the point of costing them everything, it shows us that there is solid core foundation for their testimony. And man, there's so much to dive into when we talk about the verifiability of Jesus's resurrection. So keep studying that, keep looking into that, the legitimacy of Jesus's resurrection. Trust me, as you do, your faith is gonna be bolstered. And I recognize here as we have kind of taken the approach of talking about the verifiability, the historicity of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, you may be thinking, isn't it just enough to say Jesus is Lord and move on? Well, yeah, if that's where your faith is at, then that's great. But as I said at the beginning, I don't want to assume knowledge on why we believe that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was verifiable. And If all of that is true, it demands a response of our allegiance and our faith and our obedience. If Jesus Christ is Lord, is a statement of your soul, then you're right in line for God to deserve all of your love, all of your affection, all of your obedience. This is what takes God's great commandment and actually turns it kind of into an invitation. If this is true, then love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So is that where it ends with Jesus? When Jesus said, it is finished, he died, he rose again, is he he done? Nope, it gets better even still. (laughs) Hebrews 1, verse 3, which we talked about earlier, says this, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature— And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, doing what? He is serving as our great and sympathetic high priest, as Hebrews talks about in chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus not only satisfied the law of God for our sake and ministers to us in our times of need, Hebrews 4, 16, But as our priest in all of this, this is where the Old Testament context comes back in. As our priest in all this, Jesus is actively and intimately ushering us into the very presence of God. This is why we can be in the presence of God, imperfect as we all are because of Jesus. That we may be in the presence and before the throne of God and obtain mercy. And then serving as our high priest, he continually does so. He ushers us into the presence of God, but he does so from a viewpoint of a sympathetic high priest, someone that knows and has personally experienced what we go through. Hebrews 4, 15. And if that's not enough for you, check out Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. As you can probably tell, I've quoted Hebrews quite a lot in talking about the greatness of Jesus. It's a wonderful work that maybe would be great homework for you to read through the book of Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. The former priests, the role of the priests, like the Old Testament priests, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. 
Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And I love this note that I kind of hand wrote in my Bible here. Now as then. Meaning, he didn't just do this at one point in time. He is still continuing to minister to us, to save to the uttermost. I love that phrase. To save those who are farthest from God. And he's interceding for us. He wasn't done sitting down at the throne of God, at the right hand of God. He is active and interceding for us. What a belief. What a belief that that when I pray and live my life open before God, seeking his presence and his power in my life, you know what's happening in the very presence of God Almighty? Jesus himself going, yes, that's John. Yes, God, listen to that prayer. That's the guy that I have justified and he has accepted and empowered because of what I have done on his behalf in the very presence of God. So for strength, for times of need, for spiritual correction, repentance, even moments just like this one right now, Jesus is affirming by his own authority that all things in my life, in your life, will work together for good. And God the Father will always, perfectly, answer the prayers of his Son. One more absolutely awesome point in belief about Jesus. Jesus presently rules as king over all creation in an already and also not yet sense. He is king. He has conquered sin and its power over God's chosen people. And even more than that, we look forward with great anticipation to the time when he will completely usher in his kingdom. That's the not yet reality. As Jesus continues in the meantime to call all people to him for salvation. And upon Jesus' bodily and sudden return, he will culminate his victory by establishing his kingdom perfectly and completely for all people who have believed in him and accepted his forgiveness and his offer of new life. So when we talk about the sudden, visible, personal, bodily return of Jesus, we are talking about one of the most exciting and also often misunderstood, certainly often debated, beliefs of our faith. And if you're, you're looking for details and specificity on end times here or eschatology, I'm going to stop short of much of that. But I will say that each of us, each of us needs to eagerly await for Jesus' return. Matthew 24, 44, Jesus said, You must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. John 14, 3, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. And among many others, you've got John's book, The Great Reveal, Revelation. And it ends with this. Our Bibles end with this. Jesus' promise, surely I am coming soon. And John's response, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. God does not intend us to know the hour or the day of his return. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. He does, however, intend each of us to long for that return and expect that it could occur at any time. To be ready for Jesus' return is to be engaged in devotion and obedience to him, no matter what our situation in life, right up until the moment that he returns. That at that point in time, he may look to each of us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew chapter 25, 21. So three things. What are these beliefs about Jesus mean for you today? Gain confidence in the verifiability or the historicity of Jesus. Gain confidence in that. We only briefly reviewed facets and verifiability of of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. There's so much more to bolster your faith. Start with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the first place to start. Or pick up a book like Mere Christianity or The Case for Christ. And you'll see that your obedience is bolstered as you go, if this is really true, 
It demands my passion, my response. That confidence builds your faith, builds how you live out your life. Secondly, trust and obey Jesus. Trust and obey him. His sufferings are completely sufficient for all of your sins. Each and every one. And then he invites you to come to me and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Trust in his perfect and unconditional love for you to guide your values. To guide what you believe and how you live out your lives. And remember that as you do that, he's backing you up. <laughs> He's interceding on your behalf in the very presence of God Almighty. And lastly, be ready to live in light of his return. If you knew that Jesus were going to return in 24 hours, would it change how you view your values today, your relationships, how you approach life? I think that his command to us to be ready means that we should attempt to live in light of his return in the here and now. Even if we think it's unlikely to happen today, be ready and live in light of Jesus' return. Join me in prayer together to this awesome, awesome God. All that we've said, I pray that our faith is stirred and bolstered. I pray that what results is that you are glorified in a way that is more real, more tangible than ever before, Jesus. I pray that we would see that your work on the cross and in the resurrection, even that was not it. That you are king over all creation and that you are presently interceding for us in the presence of God the Father. And that we get to be in that presence, be in relationship with God boldly, as scripture says, because not because of any of our merit, but because we look to Jesus and say, that righteousness is credited to me. And God, if we truly believe all of that, and we truly believe not only that, but that your promise is that you will return and usher in your kingdom perfectly, help us live for that. Help us live more and more in light of that and conform look more like you and less and less like our old selves. Like John the Baptist once said, I must decrease and you in me must increase. May that be the case in all of our lives and our obedience. In your name for your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, thank you all for joining us online. We'll see you next week. And those of you in the room will join our groups and see what we have to share with one another.